Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about nuclear magnetic resonance, which is one of the experiments we will be performing in our modern physics lab course. So, in order to understand how our NMR machine works, uh, we will introduce a concept of electron spins and the quantization of, of electron spins. Explain this historic Stan Gallup experiment. Later, I'll talk about uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, which is what we'll be measuring. Okay? Specifically, we'll be measuring water, and we'll describe an experimental setup. Okay. Alright, so let's get started. So, the Stan Gale experiment performed by these two uh, physicists in Frankfurt uh, was the first experiment to verify the quantization of spin and even the existence of spin itself. So, in this, type, in this experiment, you have a beam of a molecular beam or an atomic beam of silver atoms, and these silver atoms are hot. So this is a hot beam. And these are neutron atoms. So the total charge, the, the, the charge is zero. So this, uh, this is not charged. And you make this molecular beam pass through what we call a stern apparatus, which is a inhomogeneous ma magnetic field. So here I have two poles, let's say north and south, and this will create an inhomogeneous or a gradient of a um, magnetic field, which is pointing this axis, the z axis, and the beam will pass through this axis. Or through these uh, apparatus. So when the beam is traveling here, when it interacts with the apparatus, they notice that the beam was deflected. So they got two beams. So they could identify two spots. In fact, because this beam it is not a, was not a point source, it was more like a, a line like that. They measured, after the apparatus, they measured the deflection like that. So they got two beams emerging from the apparatus. So one going in a positive direction, plus and the other one going to the minus direction. And, and that's quite interesting in a sense that it shows that the silver atoms, they have a intrinsic magnetization because you're interacting with a magnetic field here so there are two ways to interact with the magnetic field. One is through charges, through uh, the electric field. So for example, you can you could have an interaction by the Lorentz force, U V vector B. But in this case the charge was zero. So the force or the Lorentz force is zero. So the deflection came through a magnetic type. So these atoms are displayed is a magnetic property. And, and the fact that it's it's not a continuous distribution, so you don't have a continuous distribution here, but two points shows that these Property 
this magnetic uh, momentum can can take only two values, plus and minus. So it's a con it's quantized a quantized quantity. So intrinsically, this atom is is displaying this magnetic momentum. And later on, we'll see how uh, what's the picture to observe this magnetic momentum or that better describes this magnetic momentum. So after passing through the first apparatus, we used a second apparatus here. So the block, so the block this beam and let this beam that's pointing the Z axis. So let's call it plus one half pointing the z-axis, along the z-axis. So they use the non apparatus with the same orientation along the z-axis, another homogeneous field. So when they did pass it through this apparatus, they noticed that they got only beams going in the, in the upper direction. So this beam was filtered in, in this one, in the magnetic moment was retained when it passed through this measurement here. Okay, later on, uh, they decided to do a different, uh, use a different configuration. Let's say, now, they took this apparatus and rotated after, after this, uh, this region here, after this beam. So they take this apparatus that was pointing originally in the z-axis and they rotate it. And now, I will try to draw here in another axis. And now let's say this is pointing along the x axis. So it's pointing along this direction. And the beam that was passing here now was deflected along two directions minus half and plus half. So now it's uh, on this plane. And they obtained the two beams along the x axis. Alright, so it shows that this is a this has a vectorial property because it assumes values along different axes, and these axes are orthogonal. So the value here. Uh, the plus value here, plus one half here, on the z axis, along the z axis, uh, was only along the z axis. So along the x axis, the probability was the same. So 50% was deflected here, and 50% was deflected in the positive direction. Now, it comes the most interesting part of the experiment. One of the most interesting parts of the experiment is in a very uh, historic and important experiment. Is when they decided to place another another apparatus, rotating back and pointing on the z-axis. So let's go here. And now I have a gradient along the z-axis after passing through this one that is pointing along the x-axis. And now let's plot this one. And they observe, observe that 
now we got two beams. So they observe two beams in the screen, one pointing in the upper direction and the other one pointing in the opposite direction. And if the beam was originally filtered, so this, this magnet momentum was originally filtered. So here it was taking only, they were taking only the, the magnetic momentum pointing along the uh, positive z direction. But after measuring the x axis, when you try to measure back along the z axis, they got two beams. So the original uh, value here, uh, the original measurement, the original value was destroyed. So this is a, a characteristic of a, a quantum system that you, you put the, the, the value of the, of the spin after uh, you measured along the z-axis. And we got exactly 50% here and 50% here. Alright, so this demonstrates, this experiment demonstrates the quantization of the uh, of this magnetic momentum. It also demonstrates uh, this destruction of the original measurement of the original value. It also shows that you have uh, spins pointing in different, or spins at this magnetic momentum pointing in different directions. So, in order to point in different directions, so, so if you have the magnetic momentum here, B, or a magnetic field B, uh, this magnetic momentum of the of the electron. So suppose this is the z-axis, and here you have a y here, and here you have x. x. Draw a number here. So let's call along this direction here. The magnetic momentum that's pointing up, and this is the x axis. So, in this measurement here, you have only a positive value. So, the magnetic momentum is pointing up. But this momentum, this uh, Momentum has also components along the x and the y axis. So, in order to assume, and you don't know a priori, uh, before making, uh, before performing this measurement here, you know that the probability of getting plus half and minus half along the x axis is 50%. The same is valid for Z, for the Y axis. So if you rotate here, if you try to measure along the Y axis, you get the same. So in order to get components of the X and Y axis, this has to be uh, precise. So this is a classical picture. So let me draw here because here I have more space. So if this is the magnetic field is pointing along this, the Z axis, so the spin will be precessing along, or the magnetic momentum will be precessing along this axis, so that it can take up values along the X and Y axis. So this is the magnetic momentum precessing. And this is why 
it gets its name as spin. It has a, it's similar to if you if you think of a, a, a charge uh, rotating and you can create a magnetic field. But in this case it's a magnetic momentum that's processing. And this is a very simplistic interpretation because in fact you cannot determine the position here of the spin and the spin takes only two values here. So uh, you may think that if it's processing here uh, in a single electron, if it's processing, so when it's pointing along this axis here, the spin would be zero along the y-axis. But then that's not true. So this is a simplistic approach. Or interpretation. Alright, so so we will stick to this processing picture because it's the easiest to visualize. So this is analogous to the Bohr model of the atom, where you have the nuclear the nucleus here, and you have an electron. So for example, suppose this is a, a, a hydrogen atom. So let's say you have a proton here, and you have an electron here. So the electron, you know that it takes a quantized orbits, this planetary model, and and you know that this is not what's going on exactly because it cannot determine the position of the electron. All right, now we can talk about nuclear magnetic resonance. So here we are discussing electric spins, but other magnetic particles also have this problem, spin, it's spinning uh, along an axis. So, so we'll be dealing now with the nuclear spins. So we erase this part. You know, we talk about the nuclear magnetic resonance and R. And, and you know that if, if you have a, an atom with one spin, and suppose this is the energy of this atom for this problem, say with the spin. If you apply a magnetic field, then suppose you apply a magnetic field here, and suppose you have two spins here, so you have spin up and spin down. So if there is no magnetic field, no interaction with the field, uh, the energy of these two spins up and down will be the same. So let's say this is plus one half, and this is minus one half. So the energy will be the same, and this is called these are called degenerate levels. So when you apply this uh, strong magnetic field, you can lift this degeneracy. So suppose the field is pointing in the upper direction. So the, uh, the nuclear spin that's pointing along the field will have a lower energy and the, the nuclear spin pointing in the opposite direction to the field will have a higher energy. And this is uh, easy to visualize because the energy of the magnetic dipole here
is equal to minus mu dz. And this can take actually two values. So, uh, so if you can have here plus one half and minus one half, and this will be plus one half and minus one half. So when you have when you are when the field is pointing or the dipole is pointing along the 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 field here, which is pointing along the z direction, the energy will be minus uh, a half half mu. I'll use I'll use this notation mu dz times dz. So this is uh, so if this is plus one half. This will be minus mu divided by two dz, and if you if you take the opposite spin, this will be minus minus one half mu dz is equal to plus. Where mu is the um, magnet dipole moment. And this splitting will be proportional to the, the splitting energy that you can calculate by subtracting this minus this, so the delta E here. This creates an energy gap. This is equal to E minus one half minus E of plus one half, which is equal to this. So now the levels are known degenerate. And, and now you can uh, you can start uh, controlling your system or your sample in order to move uh, move nuclei from here to here, from this state to this state. So. What one happen? An atom can be or can have uh, can show an MR signal if the atom has an odd number of protons or and neutrons. Now, uh, and why is that? Uh, simply because if you have this situation here, where you have a even number, of protons, let's say this is helium, helium 2, so you have two protons. So the proton, when you apply a magnet field, one will be pointing up, the other will be pointing down, and you cannot take a proton from here to here and flip the spin. That's what happens when you try to apply a magnetic field. So if I have only one 
one speed pointing up. So when I apply the field here along this axis, the spin will be pointing up. It can also point down uh, depending on the on the temperature of the system. But for simplicity, let's put it uh, in this level. Let's place it in this level. Now, if you apply a RF field, whose energy or whose frequency is h power omega, which is equal to this delta E, which is equal to mu PZ, you can take the, the speed and you can flip it to the upper state. So, this will cause this speed to flip. And later on, this speed can decay back. So, this can decay back by a process called free induction. Free induction decay. So this thing can flip back and then we need um, um, RF signal or electromagnetic radiation. So this only happens if you have a long number of protons in the neutral. So if you have paired or an even number of protons in neutral, so as I said before, so if you have even protons or even number of protons, now when you split the levels by applying a magnet field, a strong magnet field, now you cannot take these proton from here to here because this level is already uh, you cannot flip this speed because this level is already already occupied and by the poly exclusion principle you cannot take this speed from here to here so this will not uh, cause a transition a speed flip if you if you apply a, a RF field all right so you know that only when you have a odd number of protons in neutrons, you can get the um, EMR signal. That means that the number of atoms that you can measure now is limited. And we'll be working with, and you'll be interested in water, H2O. So So, hydrogen has one problem. So, you can get an MR signal from hydrogen. Oxygen has eight protons, so it's oxygen six, uh, has eight protons. and eight neutrons. So it has a, a even number of protons and neutrons. So you get no NMR signal. So in a body when you're measuring the water content, you are actually measuring hydrogen. There are all the elements uh, that can also uh, be measured, but, but we will focus on attention on hydrogen only. Alright, so that's the basic of NMR. You apply a field, the field you will split is the generate levels, and then you can control the population in these states 
by applying an electromagnetic radiation, in this case a radio frequency field. In your sample, you have many, many atoms. You have an ensemble of atoms, molecules. So you actually get a, a distribution of, of atoms in state. In state. So, so now let's say I have here. Now you, I will represent the entire system. Now. Instead of representing only for one one atom, like I was representing here, but I will represent for the entire ensemble. And on the entire ensemble, we have a population of. Uh, atoms that are with spin up or spin down. So, and this is mixed in the center. And then we now to apply the field, the magnetic field, the part of the part of the atoms will be in the ground state. And part of the atoms will be in this excited state. So there is a population, a number of atoms in the ground state, let's call N plus, because this is pointing plus direction, and let's call this N minus. So the difference, delta N, between these two populations n plus in 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 minus minus n plus is given by the Boltzmann distribution E minus delta E divided by K D T. So this is for all distribution. And you know that for a spin one half system, the delta E is equal to mu B. So, if, yeah, part of the population will be here, part of the population will be here, and at room temperature, the difference between these two levels is the population of these two levels is very small. So, it's only a uh, few parts per million, doses of parts per million. So, it's very small, a very small population. So, that means that. If you apply a magnetic field on a sample, the sample at room temperature will be weakly magnetized. Because you always have, um, you can always populate this level by thermal uh, interactions. And for simplicity in my mind, I will use this picture for a single atom. So I will assume just that the population is in the ground state. But you have to have this in mind, and there is an exercise in your notes to calculate this difference here, when you have, or to find an expression for this difference, when you have uh, for general Spin by spin atom here instead of spin one half. And I can take uh, the take values 
So this is the photo uh, momentum. This can take these values. So take values such as one half, one, three half, and also negative values. So the magnet momentum is transition. So if you have, let's say, spin one, I equal to one, you actually can get M. This is the magnet moment m equal to zero, or one minus one, m equal to zero, and m equal to plus one. So the total number of levels is two i plus one. And the transitions occur between neighboring values, Ln equal to 1. But we will be working with a spin half system, just a water. Now we will discuss our parameters which is a homemade one, so it's different from the commercial NMR machines and there are subtle differences. As you see shortly. So in order to split the levels, you need a strong field. So this is provided by our, um, our experimental apparatus or setup. So it has a set of coils. In the set of coils we apply a magnetic field. Suppose this is the Z, the Z direction. And I put my sample over here. So I apply a strong magnetic field. I want this direction using the set of coils. And with that, I will split the energy levels. So now, let's say, I'm taking only the, the atoms that are pointing along the field. So the strong in the in, uh, in the order of magnitude of two kilograms. And one gauss is equal to 10 to minus 4 tesla. That means that the fields I have there on the order of 0.2 tesla in our setup. So this is 0.2. Tesla, which is one order of magnitude, more than one order of magnitude, smaller than the commercially available NMR machines. So you have this strong field first. Um, I think it would be useful if I draw it larger here. So. Now I have 
introduce another another field pointing along this axis is here. Along this axis, and let's call this PC zero. Oh, or that they have, they can change the nomenclature and call this BZ0 and this BZ1. Where BZ1 is weak and BZ0 is strong. And by week, I mean around 60 dollars. And strong is on the other, the altitude is on the other uh, 15 dollars. So that B Z1 is much smaller than B Z0. And not only that, I will modulate this field in time. So this BZ0 will be a fraction of time. So this will be BZ0 time, which is the amplitude. Sign of two pi f t, where f is the frequency of oscillation. In any case, f is equal to sixty hertz. So with this weak field here, if I apply weak field that will oscillate. In time, I will change the position of these levels. So the effect of this weak field that's oscillating in time is to shift these levels around the center here. So this is like the system is. Breathing, so it's doing like that. And this is oscillating time along the z axis. And the classical representation of this is, of course, in this case, you have the spin processing pointing in the other direction and processing here. And this is the z axis. Now I can flip this spin and I can do it by applying field orthogonal to this to the z axis. So I can take this spin and flip it. And I can do it by using another coil, in this case a coil or a set of coils. So here, that's orthogonal to the original direction, the z direction, and then I will create a field here, an RF field along the y axis. So this is the RF field. And this will be on the order of field memories. In our case from four to nine memories. And when you do that, when you apply this field, the RF field, you can flip this pin. So we draw here so there is an RF Field coming here and take this pin 
from this y2 to this y. So we can populate the upper layer. In our set of coils, this, this coil is capable of detecting this fluid. Um, if you, we are, our in our system, we measure absorbance. So we are not in detecting, because in original NMR, this fluid this is split, split back, or you can measure the the component along these axes, yeah, the magnetic field component along these axes. But in our system, we measure absorption. So we are capable of measuring when there is a flip in this spin. And the flip only occurs when the energy here of the, the difference of energy between these two levels match the RF frequency. So this is oscillating. Okay, now, and only when you pass through the resonance, only when the RF field that you select there, you select between these frequencies. So when only when the RF field matches the the difference in energy, you can get the flip of the spin. You can observe the flip of the spin. So you select there. So if, if the frequency is too high, so for example, if the frequency is, let's say from here to here, there is no flip. So only when it matches. And in our case, as we are constantly changing the position of, of these energy levels, we are constantly going out of resonance. So we are changing using this field, the, the weak field, that's oscillating along these axis. And this is fixed, the frequency is fixed, we can tune there, but it's one single frequency. And you are going in and out of resonance. So, now let's say we have this this frequency, this RF frequency, So only when the level is, only in time, when the level is in this position, you will observe the flip of this one. So you can go out of resonance, then you don't see anything, you don't detect the absorption in the coil. And if the, uh, and, and if the, the, the difference in energy is in this position here, you won't detect the detect the either. So we have three fields. Okay, so we have the original field, the strong field, B0, this field, the weak field, and you have the field pointing along the y axis. So this is a little bit jumped here, so I will write it here, all fields we have. So we have B. This is zero, which is a strong field. We have B. Z1, which is a function of time. So this is Z1 sine 
of two parts of T, and this is a weak field, and you have the field along the Y axis, which is a fire field that you turn from 4 to 9 megahertz. So, as you have two fields along the z-axis, you can also define the total field along the z-axis. So, the total, total field is a function of that. So, this will be dz0 plus dz1 sine of 2 pi at t. And our system is detecting absorption in time, and it's actually doing a derivative. So let me clean this part here. So we are measuring derivative of differences in absorption. So you expect that the signal the current and you are measuring is a function of the time because you are changing the time is evolving here and the, uh, the energy levels are changing so you have a great thing of the energy levels so this will go like this so when it passes in time when it passes through resonance You get the you can get a peak. Or you can get a, a in this case you get the yeah, as a net absorption, I can draw this for simplicity. In this way of open time, so when you go in resonance, so you can go in resonance. Let me draw here because that would be easier. So now suppose this is the frequency, the RF frequency, and suppose you are changing the energy levels. Let me draw another column. Blue one. So you are changing these energy levels by applying a weak field. Here is a little bit exaggerated, but it will be easier for you to visualize. Uh, so when you are out of resonance here, the signal will be zero. And then when this starts moving up and it matches this exactly size, exactly this size, then you get the peak. And then it becomes bigger here, you are out of resonance again. So the signal is zero. But this will go back again, and then you also get another signal that will be in the opposite direction. So this will go back, pass the other side, and you get a signal but in the opposite direction. So you get something like this. You get a signal in a coil.
in the, the signal will oscillate at 60 hertz. So this should go like this. Better yet, let me draw in the right scale, so you should get something like that. In the coils, not in your measurement. So I'm interested in, I'll be interested only in one cycle. You have this one. And I'll, I'll be interested in only half the cycle, only in this one. So I'll clean this part here. This will, won't, won't be relevant for our analysis. So this is the absorption signal, but we are measuring the derivative of time. So Remember, so you are measuring differences only the derivative, so you are measuring ds dt. So you have to take the derivative of this curve, and you can easily see that here the derivative is going up until it gets to zero, so it goes like this. It decreases until it gets to zero. And over here, the slope becomes negative. And here, so plus. So on this side, it will become negative. So this is negative, and then it goes to zero again. So this is what you see in the oscilloscope when you are measuring the NMR signal. So we will be looking for this signature in the oscilloscope. So we will be tuning the RF signal. So we will be tuning this one of 5 to 9 megahertz and we will try to find the signal in the oscilloscope, the derivative of the absorption. Another important quantity that you can measure in this setup is the so-called defacing time. And I will explain uh, what is the interpretation, the meaning of the defacing time. So if you take, let me increase this a little bit more. So the absorption signal, let's say absorption, a function of time. Goes like this. That means in, in, if you transform from time to frequency domain, you get from power signal, you get the same, the same kind of feature. So in NMR, the line shapes. Well, this is called the resonance line shape. Line shape is a Lorentzian function. Where we have a center here. This is the resonance frequency. So this is just like a harmonic oscillator, a driven down harmonic oscillator. And the signal of the absorption. Uh, let's, let's call this S omega, which is function of omega, is equal to gamma divided by omega minus omega zero squared plus gamma squared divided by two. So this is this represents this curve here. 
where I've gone on here. is the width of this curve. So the full width I have maximum. So you can you can find so this is the so this is the line width of the curve. So the, the resonance can be very sharp if the damping as you know from a monic oscillator. If the if the resonance is very sharp, that means that the dumping or the interaction with the environment is very low. And this, if this is very broad, then the interaction with the environment is very high. So you can measure this gamma, which is the frequency domain. You can measure it in the time domain, you know, set up. So if you measure from this point. So this point here, this will give you what they call, call the dephasing time. So what's the interpretation of the dephasing time? So suppose you excite the system. My spin system, and they start to, when you excite it and inflate the system, or the spins, so suppose you have several spins here, that they are processing along these axes. So I'll draw many a few spins here. So I can draw even another one. So here I have my net momentum, and here I my net field, and I process. So when you excite, the spins are all in phase. So they are moving like, uh, like John Travolta, right? So they are moving like that, all in phase. And then, after a certain time, you do, do the interaction in the environment. In this case, in speed and relaxation. Spin, spin, relaxation, the phase now can change, the phase between the speed. So one can be pointing this direction, the other can be pointing this direction. And so on and so forth. So this is what's called the defacing, the defacing time. All right. So with that, I finished my analysis. I will I will make a video of a of our setup. And I will explain step by step how to do the measurements. So I'll see you soon.